Okay, <laughs> now again, um, welcome to the 17th session. Um, yes, I was muted, I seen. I was checking between uh, the different things. Um, my name is Barbara Hoff, I'm a postdoc at Lausanne, and I'm serving this great event today as a chair. With me on the screen are Mateus, Xenia, and Alexander. Um, just as a reminder for everyone new, all presentations take place in a row and last between 12 to 15 minutes. Please engage by asking questions and making comments, which only I and the tech support will see and um, our presentation. I will filter and I will read them after the three talks. Please um, use the question and answer button, not the discussion button, to tap in your questions. The session will last for one hour. Um, so we shall now begin with the first uh, speaker, which is Matteo Duarte. Hi, welcome again. Um, Matteo is nominated by the Science and Empire Commission. He holds a PhD from Paris and is now a postdoctoral researcher at the Re University of St. Andrews. His main research interests lay in the intersection of history of science and global history. Today, he talks about beyond science and empire. Thank you so much, Barbara. I will now share my, my screen, which is always a... Um, a complicated moment, but I hope I hope you can see my presentation. No. Okay, okay. I hope you can see the presentation. I just need to do this. Okay. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on wherever you are. Uh, my name is Mateus Duarte, as Barbara well said, and I would like. Uh, to stress how honored I am for have been here uh, to talk about science and empire. I have no doubts that a myriad of other people would be very fit to discuss this topic. So I'd like to thank the Science and Empire Commission to have appointed me, uh, appoint my name, and I hope I will uh, fulfill their uh, expectations. So my presentation today uh, beyond Science and Empire, Past, Present, and Future Questions, uh, is divided in two parts. In the first, I present uh, a summary of the emergence of the dyad, Science and Empire. In the second part, I discuss the dialogues that Science and Empire has established with the so-called global turn in the history of science, and how this dialogue can potentially transform the dyad, science and empire. Okay, so to start the first part, uh, in the canonical narratives that structure the history of science in the United States and Europe in the mid 20th century, such as the works of Alexander Coehe, Rupert Hall, or Thomas Kuhn, Northwestern Europe, the so-called the West, is uniformly depicted as the fountainhead of modern science. Uh, it ignored not only parallel process carried out in the rest, but also the role of European colonial and imperial expansion in the emergence of modern science. However, judging by the steady outputs of high quality books, articles, and conference devoted to the, scruti to the scrutiny of aspects of the relationship between science and empires over the last several decades, it's patent how absolutely mainstream the theme of science and empire has become in the history of science. Uh, so much so that Andrew Goss, in the introduction to a recently published handbook on science and empire, referred several times to the, and I quote, the imperial turn in the history of science. End of quote. Uh, so the imperial turn, whatever it, it really means, and whenever it actually took place, is not anywhere close to possessing a unified, uncontexted uh, meaning. The dyad science and empire is, in important ways, a kind of 
wild card or floaty signifier that can be attached to very different historiographical attitudes, theoretical or methodological projects and research agendas. Perhaps most importantly, science and empire can be related to larger questions. For instance, uh, how were imperial orders and science and science imbricate with each other in the early modern and modern periods? Were empires and the science united in a process of co-construction or did the one influence the other? Sorry, or did the one, even as it was influenced by the other, dominate the later development? Multiple and contradictory answers to these interrogations have been given by historians of science over the last 40 years, 40 years, depending on the meanings they attributed to the very constitutive terms, science, empire, and modern, and so on. To advance a historical, but not a genealogical account of the historiography of science and empire, a good starting point could be found in the early 1980s when a criticism against George Bazala's famous thesis of the spread of modern science came specifically from a quite heterogeneous and loosely structured group of historians of science that started to meet by the middle of the decade under the banner of science and empire. In foundational meetings held in India, Australia, and France, and in edited proceedings that were to become quite influential, the group stressed, for instance, that advanced knowledge practices existed in the rest before the arrival of Europeans, who were responsible notably for suppressing, if not, out of, if not stealing and repacking traditional indigenous or local forms of knowledge and ways of knowing. Casting in general, a very negative eye on European imperialism, historians of science associate with the group forcefully made the case that modern science was not a gift from Europe to the rest, but much more frequently an imposition. The cluster also paid a great deal of attention to the ideological power of modern science in justifying British imperialism and the French mission civilisatrice in Africa and Asia while stressing the operative role of scientific practices such as cartography, statistics, and medicine to European imperial rule. In parallel, a distinct approach to the study of the relationship between science and empire began to emerge in Latin America in the 80s. History of science has long been practiced in Latin America, at least since the 1930s, when, when it first caught the attention of scientists in search of a past and a future for their own discipline, disciplines. However, the establishment of the History of Science journal called Kipu in 1984 in Mexico represents an important landmark because it triggered a wealth of innovative studies focused on the cultural and social aspects of science in Latin America. The journal's title, a reference to an Inca device used to gather data and make sophisticated calculations, was a rather symbolic chart decision. It criticized the assumption of the region as a scientific blank slate before the conquest and argued in favor of the existence of scientific thought in what was to become Latin America. Influenced by debates on centers and peripheries and dependence theory, the generation of Latin American scholars organized around Kipu was mainly interested in understanding the complexities of what they viewed as a process of transfer of modern science from Europe to Latin America. Critically engaged with Basala's uh, diffusionist model, these scholars show that far from being smooth and linear as Basala suggests, the spread of modern science in Latin America was at times violent and often marked by the need to adapt and negotiate with alternative intellectual cosmologies. The Kipu generation argued that there was no such a thing as a solid path to achieving scientific independence and modernity. Instead, they showed how social groups seldom picture in the region as intellectually progressive, such as the Catholic Church or colonial officials were instrumental in the creation of the first scientific institutions in the Iberian American colonies. Despite the heterogeneity of the response given the last 
few decades to the question of what have been, after all, the relations between science and empires, no matter if in Europe or in Latin America, these various strains of work generally converge on assuming that modern science was first developed in Europe and then it's naturally diffused to or was forcibly imposed on or wingly transferred to or creatively adapted by the rest of the world in the wake of imperial expansion, if not as a precondition for it. In other words, even when those works did not view modern science as a positive object that fortunately spread from the West to the rest, most of them, most of them tacitly endorsed Basala's central assumption that Northwestern Europe and later the United States was a ultimate source and instigator of modern science. So now start the second part of my talk. Uh, so more recently, historians of science seeking a dialogue with uh, the field of global history and other relational approaches have offered a fresh look at the relationship between science and empire. Investigating the detailed dynamics of the circulation of knowledge within and across imperial formations, some scholars have stressed the crucial role played by thus far invisible agents, the go-betweens, in bringing together disparate cultural, scientific, and technical milieu. They have thus attempted to show that the emergence of modern science should be understood as a global interactive and transactional process rather than as a simple diffusionist, diffusionist one. According to this view, modern science emerged not from a static place or network of place, but, but from processes that were dynamic. It was constructed on the move in and through encounters, interactions, negotiations, and disputes between agents across the globe, European and non-European alike. These agents operate across a range of scales dictated at the same time by their local conditions and the global currents that traverse their lives. Through their interactions, they ignite, transform, or halt the process that can be viewed as fundamentally involve some kind of movement, even if only metaphorically, but also trading, translating, pass on, or withholding information, collaborate, collaborating, and resisting. Uh, European imperial expansion was a powerful force beyond, behind the creation of these global flux and the context that made interactions between agents across multiple scales possible. Nonetheless, many other European empires also, many other non-European empires also brought together willing or willing agents to a position where they had no alternative but to interact with each other and to broker the interconnection on different scales of historical agency. The most important point to be made is that the knowledge and ways of knowing that such, that sub that such ag agents carried into their exchange were in no way shielded from becoming something else in the aftermath. Agents and institutions located in the rest of the world had an active and much larger uh, than appreciated role in shaping what has usually passed as European knowledge. Nonetheless, these new approaches are not free from criticism. As stressed by several scholars, the insistence on dynamic aspects, such as the circulation of knowledge and inter intercultural interactions, can render invisible the inherent violence of everyday life in imperial social orders and, and ignore, for example, the all too real destruction of indigenous lives and forms of knowledge. Speaking more generally about transnational approaches, the historian of science, Dominique Pesch, has argued that the focus on international networks and global flows is leading the history of science to undervalue or simply ignore the power structures that conform and shape global interactions. In another vein, Stefan Ganga has recently demonstrated the pervasiveness of the world circulation in fields ranging from globalization studies to the history of science. She has argued that the term has been often used strategically simply to replace former concepts such as diffusion, transfer, or spread without really challenging them or adding any layer of novelty or critical thinking. 
Finally, I would like to add that this new global history of science is sometimes uh, very parochial, centered most of the time in the British Empire. Therefore, our knowledge about the imbrications between science, empires, and globalization is still very low when compared to other imperial formations, such as the Ottoman Empire or even the Brazilian Empire. To conclude, it seems out of doubt that these different strains of research have convincingly showed the, co the co constitution of imperial expansion, modern science, and globalization. Therefore, one could wonder if instead of the dyad, science and empire, one should not talk of a triad or a triangle formed by science, empire and globalization. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much uh, a lot for your presentation, um, which is great. And I've seen there's a lot of people in the audience and I'm still waiting for questions. Um, please add them to the to this um, question and answer button. So next um, in the line is Senya Tadakchen. I see she's already preparing. So Xenia Tadakchenko is nominated by the Interunion Commission um, for the history and philosophy of computing. So this is going to be a, a bit of a different topic. Um, she's assistant professor at the College of Integrative Studies at the Singapore Management University. Um, she has published on the history of the Soviet information age including its distinct materiality, its alternative algorithmic rationality and diverse professionalization cultures. The title of the talk today is Toward Alternative Histories of the Information Age. Thanks a lot. Uh, hello, I hope you can hear me just fine. Uh, with all the technical issues that we may have when we want to talk about alternative histories of the information age. I'm very uh, uh, grateful to be here to share some of, uh, um, of the, probably to share the state of the uh, history of computing and uh, curious enough, it was perfect for me to uh, go right after Matthias, right? Because it turns out that we do share exactly the same preoccupations when we are imagining the future of our field. Um, so before delving into the alternatives, I would like just as Matthias did to remind about the the state uh, and the history of the field itself uh, as computer as a relatively recent technology we need to imagine and to remember that the professionalization of the field of history of science is incredibly recent. Uh, if one of uh, helps us situate the history of computing in the field of history of science and technology is Michael Mahoney's uh, very, very influential article about the place of a history of computing in history of technology, which was published in the annals, in the IEEE annals for, of the history of computing at the end of the 80s, right? So this very article, which establishes history of computing as this kind of triple field, on one hand, it's about the computer as a machine, in this way it belongs to the history of technology, on the other hand, of course, we also have disciplinary developments such as computer science, so it is history of science. And at the same time, it is also a very curious artifact that represents an encounter between science and technology, right? So this argument by Malcolm Mahoney, right, dates to the late 80s. And if you just remember the publication itself, right, the volume is volume 10, which makes us realize that the journal itself is a very, very new thing at the end of the 80s. All right, so this is just to think of uh, this uh, idea of the future of the history of computing as uh, something which has been like always in our minds because we are always preoccupied with the future when we want to talk the present and it's very much a field in the search of identity still up to this moment because on one hand right we have this multidisciplinary field between history of science and technology but on the other hand we are also talking about the history which represents of history of a uh, 
moving object, right? Because if you think about the process of computerization, it's unstoppable, it's ongoing, and this is why our history is relevant, but at the same time, it means that the very object of our study is constantly uh, changing. And in this way, it's uh, very similar to Matthew's preoccupation, also from uh, the core questions uh, up to today and in the future of the history of computing, right? Just one word on the uh, this cover slide with the image, right? Tomorrow will be too late. Actually, this is not to, stay, is to say that this is the state of the history of computing today. It's quite the opposite. It's just like I wanted more to illustrate uh, the um, preoccupation, one of my kind of major uh, uh, statements for today in this uh, remaining <laughs> 10 to 12 minutes is to say that I think one of the most important things that we need to do in order to move to the future of a history of computing is to take the preoccupations of our historical actors with the future seriously. So that's kind of one big thing that I really wanted to say today. Uh, and let me move into kind of the big narratives uh, that we have, if I manage to do this. Yes, okay, all right. So let me explain what is appearing on this pretty complicated slide. Um, and what I mean by the convergence model, right? This is uh, something that we have uh, seen uh, uh, established in popular narratives and kind of in overview histories of computing, right? This incredible uh, prominence of uh, hardware and the uh, narrative of evolution, right? We know that the computers were big, they were cyberspace, the interconnected world that we have today with tiny objects uh, in our pockets that define very much transform our way of uh, living together. Um, so the very kind of advantage of this model, it's its clarity, uh, it identifies uh, historical change, uh, quite clearly with a kind of time progress line, um, not very confusing. And I think it is actually not necessarily a bad model because it does indeed represent at least one important aspect of American computer history as the development of the American computer industry, which indeed dominated the global markets over the second half of the 20th century. The problems begin when we think about this particular line and this model as the norm, because it makes us think that the kind of the situation that we ended up today with, again, the dominance of the Silicon Valley and the firms that we're all familiar with uh, is the only possible scenario of technological development. All right, so obvious problems here are the American centrism, the technological lag of everyone else, basically, right, who doesn't fit the model, and the technological determinism as the kind of the main force uh, pushing this history forward. Well, obviously, I'm not the first to notice that there are issues with this model. Uh, and already, again, uh, many years ago, so Michael Mahoney was actually uh, promoting an alternative history uh, focusing on the communities of computing, where the uh, driving forms of computerization is actually not the machine, right? And it's uh, incredible progress of computation, but the communities behind, right? So what we end up with is a pretty complicated picture of a uh, different different communities, uh, kind of each contributing something to the process of computerization. And of course, what we gain by accepting complexity and multiple errors of agency is uh, the conversation between history of computing and today's problem, right, with the data collection, cyber crime, cyber security, and to be a little bit self-reflective, very interesting developments that are happening in digital humanities, uh, a community that somehow does not necessarily always talk to historians of computing, and I think there is an interesting potential for self-reflection and dialogue there. All right, so we have a model and we have alternatives. And uh, I think what you can imagine, as I have mentioned, right, this is not my idea. This is not uh, something new. This uh, has been happening. Uh, and uh, so in terms of the slide on the left, uh, kind of the smaller books that you have here is the result of the revision of, Van Gogh, of uh, kind of the classical works that uh, I think have been inspiring the scholarship of the late uh, 2020s. 
And on the right side wall, slide, side of a slide, you I wanted to share with you examples of a couple of more recent books that I find sort of particularly representative of the power of revision of this focusing on software in the largest in the broadest sense of the term as not only code but ideas and people so i'd like particularly signal sort of the revision on uh, the totally different uh kind of uh, story that uh, appears in the new history of modern computing by thomas haig and paul Cheruzzi. and uh particularly interesting book uh, is the uh, modern world which gives us a very different history of the internet bringing in the um uh, the agency and the technical innovation of um, uh, early dial-up uh, American communities. All right. So this all is very good, but I think there is still an incredible space for revision. And this is where I think my and Matthew's preoccupations uh, uh, meet each other, right? Because we unfortunately are still working mostly, at least in terms of the uh, scope of the revisions in terms of the volume of publications with uh, a revision which is pertinent for American or Anglo-Saxon history of computing. Um, so I think there is still a lot to be done. And I think that in broader terms, uh, one of the strengths of the history of computing has been the engagement with other fields and with real world issues. All right. So I would want to share in the time that I still have, probably not that much time left, uh, but a very quick uh, point about like my own research, uh, what happens when we uh, go away from the uh, dominant uh, understanding of the computer as an American object, which led to representation, kind of the classical representation of the Soviet failure to mass produce computers by the 90s, 90s as the explanation even of the Soviet collapse of the kind of very well illustrated this, this image of backwardness from the 19th century realist painting. Um, and this leaves us with... Uh, misunderstanding of the major developments that were happening, for instance, in the Soviet Union in the uh, mid 80s, including the first much mass scale computer education reform. Uh, the store local agency, it demands from us to connect with the deep histories where computing is just a layer of much uh, broader and deeper power dynamics, including the inequalities of gender, class, and race. Uh, and again, right, the American case doesn't disappear, but it helps us sort of paying attention to what happens happening elsewhere, helps us to recontextualize the American case, right? And one obvious example, right, if we all are familiar with the illustration of PC revolution, which appeared on the cover of the time, right, it really is unreaching to compare it to the kind of the images that were circulated in the Soviet Union, illustrating on the very different image of information age, which was predicated not to the physical access on computing, but of considering the self and the subject as a site of uh, different habits of my mind, right? And this where this is a, this idea of second literacy or, and programming as a kind of work on self is coming from, and it's deeply connected to the Soviet ideals of new man and woman, as you can see through just the, the, the images themselves. Um, so I think this, like, this richer history of the past also gives us stronger connections to the present, right? The obvious example here is this association that we can establish between the Soviet notion of algorithmic uh, thinking to the very widely um, circulated idea of computational thinking today. But I would want to stress here that we are not really giving lessons of history because this would be a, a mistaken point. I think what really happens here, right, is uh, what history gives us is uh, kind of what could have happened, right, those alternatives and not the lessons. Uh, a deeper understanding of the promises and challenges of universality, I think, is much more important here than establishing genealogical connections. Um, 
So what does it mean uh, in broad terms, right? We are back to the same questions very much that Matthias has uh, uh, and the global, particular global dimension of the information age. And uh, if we have the notion of a digital flood, which is very much underlined by the power of the American computer industry, such as IBM, one more time, right? Incorporating the Soviet information society is one example of alternative information ages uh, would help us to have a richer geography, right, of uh, diffusion uh, to help actually question what is this diffusion, what drives it, and what are the local forces on the ground. So my uh, point here is actually like with the Soviet uh, alternative is not only because it's the kind of key alternative that we have for describing the Cold War experiences of the information age, but also for the methodological insights that it gives us to deal with other parts of the world, right? And in particular, what is going on, right? If we use American history as a measuring stick, right? We need to confront the problem of backwardness extending to almost the entire globe. Uh, and here I would like to point to this kind of very famous images of the social media, which uh, do reinforce uh, and reinvent a neo-colonial uh, aspect knowledges uh, such as the computer and like the uh, kind of the computerization connected to the global um, computer networks. So I'd like to end this presentation with um, uh, sort of not talking about my own work, right, but uh, sort of pointing to very interesting uh, works uh, that have appeared very recently one more time. Uh, one is The Profits of Computing, so you may not consult works published in uh, the ACM press, but this one is a wonderful uh, work by a collective of historians from different countries, uh, each kind of taking this idea of the future of computing in different places in the world very, very seriously. And another collective volume uh, is, uh, again, uh, kind of corresponds to what, this idea that I had that we really need to engage with today's issues, right? And this is what this volume does. Your computer is on fire. I would like to maybe to be over optimistic here. And I, I really like uh, Kavita Phillips' contribution in Your Computer is on Fire, which is entitled From the, Inter the, the Internet Will Be Decolonized. And so I believe that, you know, very much as the internet will be decolonized, as we think critically through the Cold War histories uh, of the internet. So there will be a global history of computing. And uh, my conversations with uh, graduate students recently, especially like uh, I met a graduate student from Singapore, uh, just starting his PhD gives me hope that this is very real. But at the same time, I like the, the book over there on top of the slide actually reminds us that the stories of division of the, and geopolitical competition are still very, very present, and we also need to keep engaging with those uh, to kind of provide a bit of a historical uh, alternative and historical setting to the strength of the emerging uh, narratives that oppose, uh, for instance, China, Chinese and American technological order in the field of artificial intelligence, right? So I hope that you know, our field of history and its future history of computing and its future would be strong enough that we'll have a voices to um, provide more complex stories than just the, the stories of confrontation. I'd like to stop here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for this contribution. Um, thanks a lot for connecting it also to the question of the empire, um, to what you see a little bit in uh, more recent history. So the next talk is even going to um, more recent things, and it's going to be a special surprise. And I hope it's going to, it, it went from the backstage to this floor better than my voice before, uh, because it's going to be a video. Um, um, I'd like to introduce to the public the um, Alexander Petrovich. Please, everyone, ask your questions uh, in, in the chat so I can read at the end of this uh, video presentation to engage in a discussion of the different topics. So um, Alexander, 
Petrovic is nominated by Serbia, is professor at the University of Belgrade. His main present interest is the social impacts of artificial intelligence and the relationship between theology and technology. Um, he will talk about history of science and the end of history today. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Warm hello to you, Barbara, and to all colleagues and friends that follow us at the moment. I must uh, thank also to the Division uh, for History of Science and Technology and the British Society for History of Science, who organized such a, for the History of Science community extraordinary event, really. Especially thanks for kind efforts to Thomas Haddad, together with Lisbeth de Mol and uh, Sam Robinson. Let me begin with the insight that it seems that there has never been a worse time for the question of history of science. The reason is very simple. At the moment, it is ideologically proclaimed that there is no history and that we don't need a history in the flow of time. Interestingly, both the West and the East agree that this is the time when history ends. The popular American writer Francis Fukuyama proclaimed not so long ago that history is over and that we should prepare for the end of its dialectics. History cannot exist without the clash of opposing powers. Uh, the Russian Alexander Dugin also recently spoke of the end of history and that the main struggle today is the struggle for domination over the end of history. So we can no longer use the term history with a clear conscience. History as the main concept of the enlightenment has been dethroned and basically there is no more time and space for history. To understand this, it is important to distinguish between the history and time. They are not synonyms. There is no history without time, but time can certainly exist without history. In principle, it is possible to have time that is freed from the memory, the collection of events, meanings, interpretation, expectation, etc., that make up history. Pure time divided from history is a possible state of the art. In order to better explain these connections, which are not part of a general education, I, with collaborators, made an exhibition about time, of course, a very difficult, almost impossible task, impossible mission, which was happened about a year ago in the frame of the European capital of uh, culture. I would ask uh, uh, for, for, for a video, if, if Sam is present here. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, please uh, play another one.
So, uh, what is the message uh, behind all of that? Time is autonomous existence. And the history is the inability to understand time. Where is this evident? Paradoxically, history disappears because there is too much history. If you open any media, there are almost no events that are not historical. It seems that this concept serves the media and their masters to make a noise. Historical personality, historical summit, historical conference, historical football match. History is no longer an enlightened concept, but inflated, trivial attribute for whatever popular culture wants. It is kind of cellophane wrapping for almost everything that goes on. In this sense, the concept of history is more or less useless. Such a condition inevitably affects science. Since the 18th century, science has had a latent but powerful function of apology of history. All great invention or ideas are called historical, which is a kind of quality brand. In fact, history is a, a real brand of science. Since science is publicly accepted as the main driving force of modernity and the flagship of history. But in this uh, Solomon Prize lies the hidden place of the problem. The question is the meaning of science at the proclaimed end of history. Science in its uh, modern Western form as a mechanism has been highly involved in producing history ideologically and technologically. But strange enough, it seems that the result of all these efforts is the end of history, where human values are replaced by transhuman ones and the mind as a basic human faculty is replaced by artificial intelligence. Paradoxically, again, the result of the exploration of nature has produced intelligence in artificial form as if there is an artificial being hidden in the core of nature. So the question now is whether the machine in parallel virtual reality can continue to produce history and science, or whether they will just perform technologically different kinds of simulation. Either way, science is imperceptibly but efficiently turned into technology. Technology is practical knowledge deprived of basic questions as well as ethics. As such, technology really cannot produce history, but only spend time trying to make mirrors and raise artificial history as an illusion that behaves as a matrix during its standstill in a heroic pose of progressus ad infinitum. There is not too much space for science in such a kind of world. What then is solution for the future? The solution is in the past, it is well known. Its name is Isaac Newton. And why? Because Newton balanced the aggressive mechanical paradigm that reduces the cosmos to a blind mechanism with the crucial neoplatonic concept such as transmutation, affinity, and above all, ethics. With such an approach, with such an approach, a science is possible that can counterbalance the unbearable reflexive ease of technology. Newton 
often said that gravity is not a mechanical entity and that gravity is only mathematical expression of a force whose source is in a different realm than mechanical relation. This was passed over in earlier times in the history of science, but now we are forced on behalf of future to reconsider all of that and continue science at the very point where it has been turned into technology. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Alexander, for this uh, contribution, um, which also sheds light on the on the question of what's what's the meaning of history. Um, so, uh, everyone, please, um, you're invited to ask questions in the comments, and we can talk about this. Uh, it was a very rich um, panel with uh, extremely diverse uh, topics uh, from empire to computers to artificial intelligence and the question of the end, um, the end of times or the end of histories. Um, so please uh, come up with questions in the comments, and I'm just going to read them. Um, I just uh, maybe Matthew. I would when I saw you um, at the end of your presentation, I saw your your diagram, um, and on the top is the empire, and then science and global. And I was just wondering if if is there is, do you miss is there something missing here, or do you think these three things, um, the relation between these three points, um, are all you can say about the relationship or would you um say this is there's more or how did you come up with this um diagram thank you so much barbara and thank you so much also for the the other presentations i think it was a very uh, rich uh panel no i, I absolutely you are you're absolutely right i think uh, we could add maybe more uh elements uh there in this kind of a diagram i think for for instance maybe we could only we could only have power and uh knowledge in a way uh, of embodied science and knowledge and other kind of uh uh, uh understanding about about nature and the fact that uh empire is on the top Maybe it's a kind of a Freudian slip that I, I, I commit. I, I, it was not my, my intention of saying that empire should be on the top uh, because as a, a triangle, it doesn't matter no, where the, it is. But, but maybe, maybe the empire should be in the top in, in a way because actually if we, we, we think about the, the history of empires, maybe uh, most of the time the globe was rule controlled by empires empires were maybe the most important kind of uh political uh structure of of the world in the last uh centuries it's just now that we we hopefully we don't have empires but now we can see with uh, i mean i don't need to mention all this kind of uh, we, the empires are still there so but anyway I, I i think empire is not necessarily the most important thing but uh, is uh, especially to the discussion of uh, globalization, I think we cannot have this discussion about globalization without the, the discussion about empires and about this relationship between these three. At least, I would say my point is just that at least these three points they should be there in 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 the discussions about science and empire. But and but other elements for sure they should be they should be there as well. Thanks a lot for the answer. Um, um, Alexander, after I, I was listening to your talk, I would say, uh, would you agree that technology, or also Ksenia, would you agree that technology would be maybe a fourth aspect to this relation between empire, global, and science? And would you add technology, computers, artificial intelligence? Mm. Uh, you're right. Technology is a matter of political power not of science at all uh, there is not any relation between science or technology because science as we know historians of science uh, is related to uh, four principles formulated by René Descartes and uh, Francis Bacon this is science this is a scientific method 
and technology uh, it, uh, doesn't have any meters. Only you have a guess, <laughs> it's right or wrong, and uh, uh, political interest to make some technology you know, efficient at the moment. Uh, technology at the moment is uh, divorced from the human needs. Well, who, who cares about uh, new technological breakthroughs? Well, only some, uh, you know, uh, center of powers which can use them for some uh, specific purposes. Uh, people are out of, of, of that process and uh, they openly uh, say to people that they are uh, uh, out of, of, of the game and technology will uh, uh, end all their efforts to make a better world. So technology now is some kind of mirror. We are surrounded by, by mirrors and the mirrors, they... Uh, uh, project uh, different pictures that seem like uh, reality, but in fact, this is only, you know, uh, manipulated Ill illusion. And all main uh, uh, subjects today in the media are from far from the real problem that, that we have. Actually, nobody knows what is the problem. We are facing different uh, uh, speculations about this or that, but nobody knows how deep is the problem, how deep is the crisis we are we are facing. Crisis is not a political, not economic, not economical, not a financial. This is not enough to understand what is going on. And the science should arise the right question. Without science, we cannot arise. <laughs> uh, 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 a right to question, but only wander through the uh, desert of uh, possibilities, which are uh, which are more or less, uh, more or less use, useless. So, science and technology are different concepts at the moment, and we should know that. And this is one uh, way for the future to understand the, that difference. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, Xenia, would you like to add something to that or just answer my question? Like how, because you focus a lot about on the US objects, right? So how did they, so how did they come so, come so, I think you are now on the screen. We still yeah, have, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. So just uh, to, to close this, like how did the US object become such a big issue, so dominant in the process? Does it link to the question of empire um, globalization or what is the what is the driving force here? Right. So very good uh, <laughs> question here. Um, I think they're kind of connected, right? So when you asked um, Matthias about uh, schematic representation, actually, I think there are two questions in one, right? On one hand, we can take this schematic re triangular schematic representation as the questions related to where we want to develop our historiography, right? And in this, this case, I think the history of computing sits nicely in this uh, triangular relationship, right? Because we definitely want to go beyond dichotomies and be it science or technology, right? For 20th century, we often use the uh, category of techno science anyway, right? So that's kind of one way of answering your question. But another way of answering your question is going back to the very purpose of this festival, right? Also thinking what can history of science and technology do for the future, if anything at all, right? And it looks like Alexander is very pessimistic. And there are reasons for this pessimism, I think, uh, <laughs> right? So, but at the same time, right, uh, there's also a little bit of optimism possible because if anything, right, our historical reflection precisely opens avenues for alternatives, right? So we are thinking 
like we're pres we're preserving history precisely to see those moments of conjuncture to see these opportunities for alternative designs right this of course doesn't solve the problem of power relations right this is why empires on top are probably <laughs> are there not for nothing right so i think we are back to the question of power uh but at least embracing the idea of it opportunity is there i think is the very first step um your question would then become just an illustration, right, of this power relations when sort of the largest economy emerging uh, untouched out of a World War II while Europe, right, the traditional center of uh, power in the imperial sense, right, is destroyed. So there is a very kind of um, we don't need to go uh, in many details to understand what drives the circulation of the computer as an American object, right? But I think what I was trying to argue in my presentation is that restoring the agency of local subjects is as important as tracing the history of the possession of the objects, right? And this is where we kind of the alternative materialities uh, emerge very much similar how we can appreciate some of the kind of local objects that have been displaced by imperial history written from the center. All right. Thanks, that's a great point. Um, so we, that was a very rich uh, panel with uh, rich approaches to it. And I, I'm glad you mentioned it again, that the empire is on top of the of the diagram and that we need maybe to challenge it. And also the question of, is technology the end of history or is it past, is this pessimistic or can we, um, can we go um, beyond? So um, thanks a lot uh, to the three um, speakers today. Um, we now have to close the session. Thanks a lot uh, for attending, everyone.